question. Good, then let's start with probabilistic model and state estimation. And um, um, before we start with this, actually, I um, yeah, um, wanted to tell you that next week there is the, the ICRA conferences, which is one of the two large robotics conferences, and it takes place this year in Karlsruhe. It changes every year to a different, uh, to a different city. And um, um, th this is, so to speak, our main work uh, here at, um, at, at university, or the, the, the work of, of uh, researchers. So what we, what we do most of the time is we try to be creative and come up with a good uh, problem or with a good solution or with both, ideally. Um, and uh, we try different things. You will also experience that a little bit in the mini project in the second part of the semester. Uh, and then we uh, usually write, and, uh, write a, a research paper that we submit to a conference. And, um, this process usually takes maybe um, a few months or maybe half a year, depending on how um, elaborate an approach is and how difficult uh, a conference is to get in. Um, and um, and then when the paper gets and then it's, it's the paper is being reviewed at the conference for, by by other uh, PhD students or other researchers um, anonymously usually. Um, and um, and then you get feedback for it. And then when you're lucky, then it gets accepted. And then we have to prepare a talk and a poster. Um, so Christian's paper, for example, got accepted. At, at ICRA, and he will present his work there uh, next week, and um, yeah, and then uh, and then of course we meet lots of people there, and people see the, the talks uh, of other people, and uh, we hopefully get inspired with new ideas, and uh, and then we go back to the lab and uh, do more research. Um, this is. Um, um, how it looks like uh, on, a, on a, a time scale uh, a little bit. I mean, as I said, we are continuously doing research. And uh, also you as uh, students can participate in that, I mean, either in small projects. Uh, but also, uh, usually the first contact is uh, during writing a bachelor's thesis or a master's thesis, where you're really tightly integrated in, in um, ongoing research. And um, usually we encourage also our master's students to, to write a conference paper at the end, because you have uh, done half a year of research. Uh, and usually it's the, the result is um, is really solid and, and then it makes sense to turn it into a conference paper. Sometimes it needs additional work. And um, uh, and then, yeah, as I said, it gets reviewed and hopefully accepted. And um, and then when you have a bunch of, so when you're doing a, a PhD, then usually it takes three to four years. Uh, then So you're writing a whole list of conference papers. And, um, uh, and, and these papers then get uh, usually um, merged into a, into a journal version at some point when you think that you have really covered an, a, a topic uh, or you have covered different aspects of the same topic, then you write a larger journal article. Um, um, which usually, so, so a typical conference paper has maybe six to eight pages in length. So when you Google on the internet and you find research papers and it has roughly the size, then it's probably a conference paper. And journal articles can be longer. They can be up to 30 pages or 50 pages uh, if it's really long. Uh, and then it's al al already half a PhD thesis, more or less. And then the PhD thesis by itself that you write then after three or four years um, of doing research uh, then has maybe around 200 pages or 150. Um, yeah, and as I said, there are different important conferences for our area. Uh, ICRA and IROS are the two largest robotics conferences. Uh, there is also CVPR and ICCV, which are computer vision conferences, which is also important for us. Uh, there are different journals, like the Transactions on Robotics and um, um, Robots and Autonomous Systems. These two here are computer vision journals, uh, International Journal on Computer Vision and Pattern something. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, just when you come across papers, uh, you might find these abbreviations, and then you know uh, what this what this means. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so uh, Christian and I will be at uh, ICRA next week. I mean, I will still be here for giving the lecture, but then afterwards I'll go there. And um, the cool thing is that there are. Um, so, so first of all, Christian's work got nominated for the Best Vision Paper Award, which is um, which is really an honor already. And we hope, of course, that he that his presentation will be so good that he will be selected uh, as the best uh, vision paper then by the committee. Um, there are lots of sessions um, uh, on flying robots, and um, we'll try to to see all of these talks and um, maybe present then in two weeks a few of these papers uh, to you that you that you really get in, in touch with uh, current developments and uh, ideas that people have or things that are. Uh, uh, people are working on. Um, usually a conference is divided into, into sessions and each session is a block of maybe two hours uh, where people give, give them talks. 
And um, every session has a session title, uh, which is more or less uh, gives gives you the topic of um, of all uh, of the papers and in the session. And there are lots of uh, uh, interesting sessions for us. And uh, this is just to give you an idea how you know uh, this such a uh, conference looks like. Yeah. And as I said, uh, I hope that we can bring back some papers and maybe also some ideas um, for things to do in the future. Good. So then we can start with the probabilistic state estimation and um, uh, uh, perception part. Um, so as, as you know, um, 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 perception and uh, models uh, are really deeply linked. So it's, it's not possible to perceive something without a model. So we just discussed this in the exercises. <laughs> um, it's not only that you have to have the measurements, you also need to know uh, what these measurements mean. And uh, for being able to interpret it, you need a good model. And when you're uncertain about the model, then it's uh, difficult to, to interpret them right. Um, and we as humans have, of course, lots of experience in perception. So we are perception experts. <laughs> and when we look at, at such a picture, then, of course, we immediately see something. Um, so let, let me ask you, what, what do you see here? What do you think? It's a bit blurry, but what, what, what are we looking at? Guys standing in front of Michael. Yes, yeah, exactly. So this could be his hand. Um, maybe he's even doing something. Maybe he's even doing something here. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And and we can we can tell that because we have good models and we know that this is a typical office scene uh, where somebody's sitting in front of a desk. But then when we look more closely at it, <laughs> turns out that it's actually not <laughs> a phone that, that this guy is holding, and this is also not a monitor, but <laughs> just something that looks <laughs> similar. And uh, I mean, this is this is one of the examples where you uh, see that uh, how your eyes can trick you actually because you use models um, for interpreting the world. And uh, there are of course more um, examples like this. Uh, optical illusions that you can use to to make uh, these perceptual models visible uh, to yourself. I guess most of you have seen this before, so um, there is a shadow here by the cylinder. Um, uh, but when you look at it, then your um, part of your perceptual system already removes the shadow completely. So when you look at it, you see gray and white um, uh, checkerboard boxes. Um, and um, the, the shadow doesn't really uh, impair you. But uh, when a computer would look at this, then it uh, turns actually out that the gray shades have exactly the same uh, gray tone as uh, the white shades here in the, in the shadow. And um, this means that it's, um, on one hand side, it's of course very complicated to deal um, with such problems, but it's also sometimes complicated to really see uh, how the world really looks like, because we already have so many good uh, models about the world that we uh, can immediately remove such uh, effects. Um, there are more examples uh, like this one uh, where, the, where it somehow seems to turn, which, which is also a perceptual effect in, in the <laughs> human perception system. Um, yeah, <laughs> and there are, I mean, yeah, you, you, you've seen, all of you have seen lots of uh, optical illusions, I guess, and, and, and they show somehow part of the, the models that we, that we internally have. Uh, this is another uh, nice example. Um, uh, somehow there appear black dots um, uh, in, at the corners. Um, but whenever you look at them, then of course there is <laughs> no, no dot. Uh, <laughs> Good. So, so the main problem um, that, we, that we have, as, as, uh, as you already saw, is that we can't directly observe the world state. Um, and of course we are, uh, but, we, but we need to estimate the world state because this is what we uh, want to, um, so we want to know where the quadrocopter is uh, and we need to know um, how the world looks like and so on. Um, so, um, and because we can't estimate it direct, we can't observe it directly. Uh, we have to maintain a certain belief about the world, and uh, to, we have to update this belief according to our uncertain observations and partial observations, um, and possibly also according to our actions that we that we do, um, um, yeah, accordingly. And uh, there are two important parts here of this uh, modeling process. Uh, first one is are the so-called sensor models that describe how. Um, uh, the, the, the real, the world state is linked to the sensor observation, and that's, for example, um, relevant for an odometry model. Um, but there are also action or motion models that describe um, how the world state changes when uh, you issue a certain action or a certain command. Good. So let's um, first look at uh, the uh, world state and what parts of the world state are actually relevant for, for us or for a flying robot. Uh, what, what do you think uh, do we need to, to estimate? Any ideas? Yes. Oh, 
Yes, exactly. Position, most important thing. Um, what else? Orientation. Orientation. Yes. Um, Scaling, yes, yeah. I mean that's not a property of the world state directly, but it's a, it's a, it's also part of the quadrocopter state. Maybe that it has to know how large the world is. Yes. True, true. Um, but even even in in our application where we have a flying robot, um, what what other parts of the world state might we be interested in? Exactly, exactly. Um, obstacles, uh, the, the map of the environment. Um, you might also be interested in the uh, position and uh, of, of humans, for example, when you want to follow a person through a room. Um, and possibly even uh, have an idea of the intention of somebody <laughs> uh, to know what he's doing next. Um, for example, for an autonomous car, it's important to know whether a pedestrian uh, is walk actually trying to walk across the street or just walking along the street, uh, and so on. But you're right; it, it absolutely depends on the application that you that you have in mind, and then different parts of the world state become more uh, relevant than others. Um, of course, everything is is linked. <laughs> uh, I want to illustrate this here with this uh, figure. Um, there is, of course, the physical world, and the quadrocopter observes it with its sensors and um, um, modifies it or acts upon. Uh, using its actuators. Um, usually you have um, a separation like this that you have a part that, or a module that's more related to the perception. You have more uh, planning or um, uh, executive model uh, uh, mo module and part that deals more or less with the generation of, uh, of actions. And um, the perception part of course needs the sensor model. The planning part uh, needs the uh, the world state and the uh, execution needs the motion model and um, of course it also makes sense for perception to know about the world state and um, possibly know about um, the motions um, and so on but yeah and, and in the following we try to to separate this um, uh, into, into individual components so let's first start with a deterministic sensor model um, the easiest way to model a sensor is to describe it with a function you could just say, you know, given that I have a certain world state, and then the world state could be a one-dimensional um, variable, but it could also be a highly high-dimensional uh, vector, uh, we have a certain observation function that predicts us uh, the sensor reading. And usually a function like this is relatively easy to describe because you have a physical model of your sensor, and then you know when this is the world state, then I would expect that we get the following sensor reading. Um, so a sensor model like this is, is easy to build, but of course what we usually want is to infer the world state uh, from its readings. So we are actually interested in X, uh, and we have Z, or a noisy, noisy observation of Z. So we need to invert this function. Um, for the motion model, you can come up with something similar, and that's what you did in the first exercise sheet. Um, the, uh, in principle, it's, it's again the same idea. The robot executes a certain action. For example, it moves forward uh, with one meter per second. And then um, we want to update our um, uh, current state um, by incorporating this, this action into our world state. So we have again a function that takes as input the previous world state and our action and predicts or computes the, the current state. I mean, so far so good. Uh, but of course, in reality, the sensor observations are all uh, noisy and um, potentially only partial observations and potentially missing. So uh, why would they be potentially missing? Yes, exactly. The things could get lost or the sensor could be unfunctional for a, for a few seconds. Uh, why are they partial? Or what does it mean to be partial? No one can observe the whole world. Exactly. If you had a perfect uh, oracle sensor that would always tell you exactly the world state, then this would be much simpler. But obviously you can't see, you, you most often just see a projection or some measurement of some form. And uh, of course, uh, sensor observations are, are noisy because yeah, there is no perfect sensor. Uh, the second problem is that the models are uh, also partially wrong and incomplete. <laughs> We've already seen that um, in the discussion of the exercise sheet. Um, um, no, no matter how, um, I mean, you, you can make a simple model of something, but uh, it can, um, you, can also make it, you, you can always make it more uh, complicated and more complete, uh, but it will never exactly um, match, of course, reality. Um, and um, we um, also typically have uh, prior knowledge about things. Um, 
for example, uh, the, for the quadrocopter, we could have a prior knowledge that it never can fly faster than 10 meters per second, uh, or that it um, uh, can't fly higher than a certain height, um, things like that, that we have from an external source, and that, of course, also influences our uh, estimation of the, of the world state. Good. Uh, but to deal with this noise and the, um, 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 yeah, all kinds of problems of, of real sensors, it makes sense to um, uh, replace the deterministic sensor, uh, uh, sensor function by a probabilistic version. And that means we have a probability distribution that links uh, the world state with the sensor observations. And we can have the same thing for a motion model where we have uh, the world state and the action and um, uh, then we get a distribution over the future world states. Um, of course, usually you don't have just one sensor, but a whole bunch of sensors that measure sometimes different things, sometimes the same thing. Uh, and then you want to infer the world state uh, given all of these measurements um, uh, from, say, from one moment in time. Uh, of course, ideally, or you, you get measurements um, once a second or, or, or for, for every time frame, and then you ideally try to combine all of them uh, or fuse all of them into your uh, belief state. Um, and we will look at all of these uh, problems uh, today in, in more detail. Good. To, to get started, um, I'll briefly review uh, probability theory. I guess most of you will be familiar with that, but it doesn't hurt to um, uh, look at it briefly again. Um, this uh, notation P of A means uh, that we, um, or we said we denote the probability that a certain proposition or event a holds. And, um, and this means that the probability is, of course, always between 0 and 1. Uh, there is the uh, proposition that is always true, and that has, of course, probability 1. And uh, there is also an empty set, which uh, obviously has probability 0. It never occurs. <laughs> um, and uh, then there is uh, the third axiom, and that's already... So this is really defining probability theory, which says that... Um, if you take the union of two propositions, then the um, uh, probability is uh, the probability of the one uh, proposition plus the probability of the second proposition minus um, the intersection of the two. And um, the reason why we have to subtract this here is because if you look at it from a set theoretic point of view, then we have two propositions that hold. So this is the whole event space that we have. And we have one proposition A, one proposition B, and then they could potentially overlap. So when we compute the, the union of the two sets, then we can take A and B, but then we have twice the overlap, so we have to subtract it once. Obviously. <laughs> Good. Uh, more on not notation uh, for discrete random variables. Um, um, X typically denotes, uh, or X and, and Y capital letters denote um, discrete or dis denote random variables. And a discrete random variable can take any countable number of values um, from X1 to Xn, for example. And uh, then this notation here, uh, x equals uh, one of these values, uh, then corresponds to the probability that this random variable takes this particular value. Um, this p by itself is called the probability mass function. And you can, for example, imagine this, this as follows. Imagine we have a quadrocopter or a robot that can be located in different rooms. Uh, we might have a probability distribution that tells us where this uh, robot is typically located. Um, so this probability mass function can be denoted here by, a, by such a sequence, uh, or this, this tuple. Um, and the variable room can take different, different values uh, according to the, to the different rooms. So far, so clear, I guess. Good. Good. Um, of course, you can also uh, have um, continuous random variables. Um, and then the probability for a single value of a continuous, um, on, on a continuous set uh, is always zero. So it doesn't make sense to compute the probability of x being equal to uh, 3.75 something, because it will always be zero. This is why um, people look uh, not at the absolute probability, but at the probability density function. Um, and then uh, over this density function, you can compute the probability of certain intervals. For example, you can um, ask uh, how large is the probability that our random variable, continuous random variable, is between um, um, 0 and 0 0.5, for example. 
And then this corresponds to the integral of this, uh, of the, over this interval of the probability mass function. Um, for example, you could have a robot that is standing in front uh, of a door and it um, uh, can have a continuous um, um, position along, uh, uh, along the wall. Um, and then this uh, could be how this probability density function looks like. And uh, we could ask a question, what is the probability that we are on the left side of the wall? And then you would integrate over this, or that we are on the right side, um, or that we are standing in front of any door. And then you would integrate over this interval, plus this interval, plus this interval, and so on. Uh, good. Um, then, as we've already seen, there is this, uh, there's this, this axiom that, that says that the full set uh, or the, the, the proposition that's always true uh, maximally sums to or sums exactly to one, and this means also that when we um, uh, sum over all values that a random variable can take, then the result has to be one. And the same holds also for the continuous case. So when you integrate over the full interval, then you get one. Um, there is a concept of the joint um, probability distribution, which means when you have two random variables, um, uh, uh, th this um, notation means um, uh, that you're looking at the probability that uh, one variable takes uh, this value and the other takes this one. Sometimes people omit the random variable, the capital X equals something, and just write P, X, Y. Uh, but this means essentially the same thing. Um, good. So if x and y are conditionally independent, then um, you can compute the joint probability, uh, um, uh, joint probability simply by taking the product of the two. Um, however, um, <laughs> in most, uh, most of the cases, uh, random variables are somehow related. And then it makes sense to look at the conditional probability, uh, which means, uh, which is not uh, notated by this uh, um, uh, by this bar. Um, so Px given y um, is, means uh, that we're looking at a probability that x takes this value x um, under the assumption that y already, ha that we know that y has a particular value. And um, the definition of this um, conditional probability uh, is as, as follows. Um, um, you say that uh, the probability of x given y um, times the probability that y happens is exactly the same as the uh, joint probability. Um, good. And uh, if x and y are conditionally independent, then uh, we can just, um, uh, th then this e uh, equals, um, um, so the condi conditional probability then equals the probability over x. Uh, good. There is also the concept of um, 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 conditional independence for uh, prior knowledge or side knowledge. So assume that we know that there is a particular, there is a third random variable set that takes on a particular value. Uh, then we can still look at the distribution over variables x and y. And um, we just keep this as background knowledge um, on uh, all si both sides of the equation. So the probability of x and y given set equals the probability of x given set and probability of y given set when both of them, when x and y are independent of each other given set. Um, yeah, and um, this, so even if, if two random variables are independent of each other given a third variable, this does not necessarily mean um, that uh, the two variables by itself are independent of each other. It could still be that there is a, uh, a dependence between the two, but this uh, uh, dependence is um, factorized out, so to speak, uh, by, by a random variable set then. Um, good. Then there is this idea of marginalization. Imagine you have a joint probability distribution that goes over two random variables. Uh, when you sum over one of these random variables, then you uh, just get the so-called mar marginalized uh, probability distribution over a single uh, random variable. Um, uh, uh, just to give you an example, imagine you have uh, the following probability distribution that is defined over two random variables. For example, that variable x takes value, value x1 and y takes y1. Uh, we have here a probability of uh, 1 over 8. Um, and so on. So we have 16 values that fully define the joint probability distribution. And now, of course, we can also look at the probability that um, x1, uh, x takes the value x1, 
and um, independent of y. And for doing that, we just have to summarize uh, over all values that y can take additionally, and then we find that the probability of x1 is actually one half. And uh, yeah, you can do also do that for y and so on. And if you marginalize out all random variables, then of course you should end up with one <laughs> if it's a proper distribution. Um, good. Um, there is also this um, um, for the following transformation. Um, if you have a random variable x, then we know that we can get it by um, uh, marginalizing out a random variable y potentially, and then we can replace this joint probability uh, distribution by the con uh, conditional uh, distribution. Um, um, yeah, like this. Yeah. Good. Uh, there is also the idea of an expected value of a random variable, um, which is in principle just the weighted average um, of, uh, of the all values a random variable can take on. So, um, for example, what's the expected, uh, um, the expected value of a dice uh, when you roll it? Uh, no, the, so the expected value, um, which means so the, uh, the dice can take values from one to six, right? And then all of them have uniform probability. So, so what? what? Yeah, yeah, really close, but <laughs> I mean, let's uh, let's let's calculate that together. Um, so we we have uh, one over six because that's the probability for getting a one, plus one over six times probability of two, and so on. One over six times six, and that should be uh, exactly three point five, I think. Right. So it's it's a weighted average over all va uh, values times the probability. So you take take the value um, x times the probability of, of this. And um, uh, that, that's, so to speak, the average value that we expect a random variable to take on. And you can have the same, of course, for the continuous case. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, expectation is a linear operator. Sometimes uh, you, do, you have a random variable and you do a certain linear transformation on it. Then you can uh, move this um, transformation outside of the, the expectation operator. Uh, there is also the um, um, covariance of random variables, or the, the variance of random variables, uh, which measures the deviation from the mean. Um, for example, um, if we have a, a dice that has on all sides uh, 3.5, then the variation would be zero, right? And the average value would still be 3.5. But a normal uh, dice, of course, has lots of variation, um, uh, because sometimes you get a one, sometimes you get a six. Um, there are also functions to compute that. I, I guess you've seen that in a statistics course. Uh, there is a so-called sample mean, where you just take so so we make a series of observations from a dice, for example, and uh, then we you, you sum over all observations and divide by their number, and then you get the, the sample mean. Um, you can do the same for the uh, covariance. Um, First, you need to compute the mean then, and then you look at the derivation from the mean for every sample, and uh, you normalize that with the, the number of observations. Um, good. So, um, now back to the, so that was a, 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 the summary on, on probability theory. Are there any questions so far? Good. I mean, this should have been all known by, by you, but it's, um, um, yeah, it's good to, to see it once again, I thought. Um, so imagine that we, or we are still back to our uh, original problem. We want to estimate the world state X from uh, a series of sensor, sensor measurements set and controls or maybe odometry readings um, that, we, that we send to the quadrocopter or that we get from the quadrocopter. And uh, now we need to model this, this, these relationships uh, for in the sensor model and in the observation model. Now, there are two different ways of defining that, as you've already seen. We can either have a diagnostic um, sensor model that tells us the probability distribution over the, the world state given the sensor observation. So when we observe something, uh, what is the, the, the state of the world? Um, while um, the second possibility is to have a causal model that tells, that tells you more, you know, if this is a certain world state, then we can deduce from there what the sensor probably will report on. And um, while we, in principle, need this model, it's usually much easier to construct, uh, to construct this causal model. 
Um, and an easy way to convert between the two uh, is to use by a space rule, um, which um, directly comes from this definition of uh, uh, conditional probability. Uh, and it, it says that if we need a probab the probability of x given z, then we can compute it from the probability of z given x times uh, the probability of x uh, and divided by or normalized by the probability of making this particular uh, observation. Um, yeah, this is the derivation. It's, it's really, really straightforward. Um, sometimes people give, give names to, to these individual terms. So um, the, the term, the, the probability of a certain measurement given the world state is often called the likelihood. So, so given that we are in a certain state, we observe a particular value for the sensor is called the, yeah, yeah, it's called the uh, likelihood of this of this observation. Um, then usually we have an idea or prior knowledge on what world states are actually possible um, or are actually likely. That's called yeah the prior. And then um, this term p z is is most of the time ignored because it's it's not uh, important as you will see in a second. But this is called the evidence. And um, why this is not important? Um, um, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is the following. Um, um, I mean, or the, I mean, you need it in Bayes' rule, so you need to compute it somehow, but uh, directly computing it can be, can be really difficult. And um, the, the general idea here is that uh, instead of com trying to compute it, uh, we just ignore it um, <laughs> in the beginning and then normalize the distribution afterwards because we know that the probability distribution at the very end has to sum up to one. So, um, so this is what we, what we want to have, right? Um, but we don't know this normalization term, so we can just compute this probability distribution for all possible values of x uh, and then uh, normalize by that uh, afterwards. So first we just compute a likelihood which contains the um, sensor likelihood and the, the prior. Um, then we sum up all of the individual, um, uh, all, of, all of these likelihoods, and then we just divide by this likelihood. And that ensures at the end that the probability distribution is proper and sums to one again. Um, good. There is also the base rule with background knowledge, which just means that we have a set here. I'm not, yeah, we don't, we will see later why, why we need that. Um, good, but now let's first look at, um, at a simple example. Imagine that we have the AR drone and it's uh, looking for its landing zone. Um, and um, the landing zone is marked with many bright lamps. Uh, and the quadrocopter has a brightness sensor and you can in principle consider uh, the downward looking camera as a brightness sensor, as a very <laughs> complicated brightness sensor. Um, but nevertheless, so from this sensor observations, we try to find the world state. Now our uh, brightness sensor just gives us a binary value for the moment to make it simple. So either it says bright or it says not bright. And uh, also let's assume that the world state is binary. So either we are home or we are not home. Uh, and uh, then we uh, define our sensor model, which means that we have to define the probability for uh, when we are at home, uh, what the brightness, what the likelihood is to get this bright reading and say this is 0 0.6. Uh, which then, by the law of total law of probability, <laughs> means that the probability of not observing brightness uh, above the landing spot would be 0 0.4, of course. But you know, by defining one of them, um, this is fully defined. And then we have to uh, specify what the sensor gives us when we are not home. Uh, for example, say that there are occasionally other lamps, uh, then we could get a probability of 0 0.3 um, of, the, of the sensor being uh, being triggered. And then, say at the beginning, we don't know anything, so we initialize our uh, prior on the world state to 0 0.5. And, uh, and now we do a single observation step. We assume that the robot observes light. And now the question is, what is the probability uh, that we are above the landing zone, given that we have made one sensor observation um, that says uh, there, is, there is light below us? Good. Um, so we are interested in this term here, and now we can directly apply Bayes' rule, um, uh, which is just, just um, yeah, shifting around uh, with these terms. And then you see here below that we can't directly compute the probability of observing uh, brightness. Uh, so we have to sum over the two different um, states. Um, 
Wait, 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 wait. Actually, I'm not sure whether this formula is right. It is right? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> okay, sometimes I'm a bit confused. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so, so anyway, you fill out a uh, base formula and you fill in all the numbers and then you get the probability of um, um, 0 0.67. Um, and this means that by making this observation that there is a, br that there is, uh, um, a bright spot um, below the robot, uh, the probability of being above the landing zone has increased. Good. Uh, now, um, to extend this example a little bit further, uh, uh, ass let's assume that the robot obtains another observation uh, from, a, from a different sensor, for example, or uh, from, from the same sensor, but in a different way. Uh, in any case, uh, um, a more or less uh, independent observation. Then the question is, how can we integrate this new information? Um, so more generally, how can we estimate uh, the probability of, uh, of our world state X being above or not above the landing zone uh, when we have several measurements? And um, um, this is now where the, the formula on the, on the background knowledge comes in. Uh, it turns out that you can compute this um, iteratively. So if you just apply Bayes' formula to that, um, to, to this, and then keep everything from... Um, uh, uh, everything except set, so, so we, we bring set n uh, to the front, but keep everything else as background knowledge for the moment. Then we end up with this, uh, with this formula. Um, uh, and um, now the so-called uh, Markov assumption uh, can come in, which, which says that we assume that uh, the, the current sensor measurement is independent of all previous or other sensor measurements, given that we know the world state. So this, is, this assumption is called uh, the Markov assumption. And it um, yeah, it, it usually makes sense and people uh, usually assume that um, uh, a process model is Mar uh, Markovian. Um, good, so le let's start again. So we, have, we, have, we want to compute the world's uh, probability of X given a whole series of, um, of observations. Uh, as you've seen, we can extract um, the first part using, using Bayes' formula, but then we still have these two large terms. Um, we can neglect uh, the, the, the denominator here because we can just normalize at the very end, as you've seen. So we'll just replace that by a, an eta um, uh, that, we, that we will figure out later. And, um, and then we have this term. This looks good. <laughs> this is our sensor model that we already have, typically. Uh, but now uh, this part is still the difficult uh, part. But now again, you see that this has the same form as, as this part here, so we can apply the same trick uh, to extract set n minus 1, and we can do that, of course, to the very end. So in principle, with the Markov assumption, you can, th 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 this whole complicated thing uh, can collapse into a product over all um, uh, sensor likelihoods and uh, um, times the uh, uh, prior over the world state at the very end. So far, so clear. Okay, uh, let's fill in some numbers to make this to make this uh, clearer. So assume that the uh, landing zone is not only marked with bright lamps, but it also has a visual marker. And uh, this means that we have now a second uh, observation that tells us whether or not we see a marker. And again, we have to define a sensor model. And we could assume, for example, that um, the uh, the marker detection uh, is more accurate than the brightness detection because the landing sign is more um, is, is clearer. Um, we remember from our last step we already know now that the probability of being home under the assumption that um, we've seen a bright lamp is 0 0.67. And uh, now let's assume that the robot does not observe a marker. Uh, and um, then again, you know, you can fill this in into um, the normal base formula um, uh, by making use of this of this um, result that we had before. Um, and that essentially does this iterative uh, 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 computation that we just saw. And then at the end, we obtain a probability of just 0 0.31, uh, which means that you know, even, if we ha even after we have observed a lamp, uh, but we have not observed the, um, um, uh, the landing marker, uh, the probability that we are above the landing zone has now decreased. Good. Um, so this is really something that um, that you should maybe once compute for yourself, uh, also for the for the for the exam um, at, at the end of this course. Um, it's it's straightforward uh, uh, um, uh, um, 
uh, just about the application of the of Bayes' rule. Um, but it makes sense to try it out once for yourself to get get a better understanding of how this how this works. Good. Um, so this was now for sensor models, but in principle, the completely same thing also applies to motion models or action models. Um, the I mean, so far we have assumed that the world state doesn't change um, or that there are no actions, but of course the world changes the whole time because of several reasons. For example, the um, robot carries out some actions, uh, but also other agents might carry out some actions or uh, just things change in the environment. Um, for example, the robot could be blown away uh, by wind uh, and all of that changes the world state dynamically. So we need to model this somehow uh, in our um, uh, action model or dynamic model. Good. So um, the typical actions of a quadrocopter uh, are that it uh, accelerates um, or it, yeah, it, it can move by, by changing the speed of its motors and that changes its attitude and that will lead to an acceleration of the whole quadrocopter then in a particular direction. Um, and uh, as you will notice <laughs> this week, or uh, starting from next week, that the position of the quadrocopter, of course, also changes when you do nothing. <laughs> and I put nothing here in quotation marks because the quadrocopter, of course, is always uh, uh, running, or the motors are always running. And uh, so it's doing something in principle, but uh, this leads to a, to a drift. Um, uh, which means, but, but anyway, so the quadrocopter won't stay at a fixed position, even if, it, if you don't give any action command. And even if you give an action command, like move forward with one meter per second, then it's not guaranteed that the robot will exactly execute this. But actions are, of course, all actions, including the action nothing, <laughs> uh, have, some, have some noise or will lead to noise. And um, now in terms of this, um, uh, uh, our belief about the world state, uh, it's interesting to note that usually when you make sensor measurements, your certainty about the world state gets more precise because you, you gain information, while when you execute actions, uh, typically your um, um, certainty about the world state in, uh, uh, decreases because every action or just because time is passing by makes you less certain about how the world looks like. So uh, the me sensor measurements make, make yourself more confident about how the world looks like and actions or just time makes, it, makes you less confident. Um, good. So we have seen this before. So we are looking now at the probability distribution of the successor state given uh, our action uh, current action and our previous world state. Um, let's first look at a very simple example here. Uh, assume that the uh, quadrocopter can just do one thing, namely to take off. Um, and um, uh, we have two, two, two world states, namely that we are either on the ground or in the air. And then you can draw a diagram like this. Uh, I guess you've, you've seen such transition diagrams before uh, where, you can, where we can denote these probabilities. I mean, you can also write it down as a formula, of course, but this is sometimes more easy to interpret. So when we are on the ground and we execute the takeoff action, then with a probability of, of 90%, we will be in the air. And with a probability of 1.0, or 10%, we will stay on the ground. Um, any ideas why this might happen? Yes. Someone put the hand in the robot. For example, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, of course, wireless can break down and things. So when you when you start experimenting with the quadrocopters next week, you will notice that especially in the beginning, the probability of not that the quadrocopter will not execute your your action <laughs> will be <laughs> very high <laughs> until you learn some some tricks or, or some some things to to make it um, behave <laughs> uh, <laughs> better. Uh, good. And then when we are in the air, uh, then and you, you issue the takeoff command, and nothing will happen. So with a high likelihood, you will stay in the air, hopefully. But but even then, uh, with a very small probability it could happen that the quadrocopter falls off <laughs> uh, even so you executed the takeoff action. Good. Um, and um, now the, the question of course is how can we use this motion model to, to update our belief about the world. Um, so we are interested in the probability distribution over the world state given that we have executed a certain action. And um, we can now compute this as the sum over um, of all possible previous world states, because we, we don't, so yeah, the thing is, if, if we would know exactly in which state we are now, we could directly uh, give um, uh, the, the succeeding world state by just looking at this model. But the problem, of course, is that we 
don't know um, we don't know the previous world state, but we just have a probability distribution over previous world states. So we need to marginalize out the previous world state uh, by summing over all possible previous world states and then looking both at the motion model and the probability of being having been in this in this in this world state. And the same thing, of course, also applies to the continuous case. Um, so uh, another example now with, with num or the same example now with numbers. Assume that we know that we are on the ground. So our initial world state is deterministic. <laughs> we, we have a probability of one being on the ground, and then we execute once the takeoff action. And now we want to know what the um, uh, <coughs> probability distribution afterwards is. So we, what is the probability distribution of being on the ground? Um, and now we just have to sum over all possible world states, which is two different world states uh, for us, either being on the ground or in the air. And um, uh, then we have our action model that tells us um, we have a 0.1 probability uh, of wait uh, keeping of staying on the ground when we are on the ground and executing the takeoff action and a 0 0.01 probability of staying in the air when we are in the air but we know that probability of that we are not in the air so this is zero and then uh, the overall probability of being on the ground after executing it once uh, is 0 0.1 and of course you could iterate that uh, and ask you know when you do it a second time uh, will the probability increase uh, or decrease and um, yeah then of course um, yeah, just according to these formulas. Um, we've seen, or we've, we briefly we discussed about the Markov assumption before. Uh, this is now a graphical representation of this uh, idea. Um, we have our random variables here, and we have a whole series of random variables, namely one random variable per time step about the, the world state. So at time t, we are here, we have a random variable xt that takes a particular value and over which we have a particular probability distribution. And in every time step, um, uh, we uh, get an, a new random variable, and these two random variables are uh, depend on each other according to the um, according to the motion model. And um, this is called uh, a Bayesian network, um, or uh, even a speci special cause of a Bayesian network, a so-called uh, dynamic Bayesian network. And uh, these arrows here indicate dependencies of random variables. So the future world state, xt, uh, depends on, or let's look at this, the current world state depends on the previous world state and on the, the action. And um, the measurement depends only on uh, the, the current state. And this allows us now to, to reason efficiently about the distributions over, over world, state, uh, world states. Um, in particular, it means um, uh, that this uh, world state xt plus 1, so the future world state, is completely independent of everything, um, um, of everything except these two, uh, you know, the current command and the, the, the previous world state. So everything else uh, can be completely ignored just because there are no arrows. So this is the advantage of this representation. And this is what a Markov chain um, means. Uh, are there any questions on this? Yes. Is it what? Sorry? Uh, I have, don't know what... Yeah. True. Yeah, yeah. Of course, if you if you change change a value over here, then this will influence these values here. But um, given that we know already uh, what the value was here, it doesn't matter what uh, has ha happened before, right? So this is the idea. Um, good. So this means that um, in principle we want to um, to know the. So, so the Markov assumption says that the current observation only depends on the current state. And um, uh, and it also says that uh, the, the current state only depends on the previous state and the, um, the issued action. And that you see that this makes, of course, the computation much more tractable because now we just have to look at these few random variables. Um, there are some assumptions lying below the, the Markov assumption, namely that we are dealing with a static world. Um, everything that is not contained in the world state has to be static. It can also deal with a dynamic world, but then the dy dynamic parts of the world also have to be part of the world state. Um, uh, we also it also assumes that the noise that we observe is completely independent of each other. Um, 
and of course that our model is is good or valid uh, and these are all three of the, uh, them are really strong assumptions so you should not not forget that um yeah that that, 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 uh, that this is really um that, that these are really strong assumptions but in practice you have to make some assumptions to make things work and this is what most people um in robotics uh, typically assume um good so that brings me to um uh the first filter that we can now use first efficient filter to compute the um uh the current state so uh recapitulate uh, let me recapitulate we have a stream of observations a set that we get from the sensor and a set of actions which are our steering commands um or our odometry um for example uh we have a sensor model um and an action model and we have a prior probability uh, to, uh of the of the system state and now we want to estimate the state of the dynamic system which means that we want to estimate the state at uh, in the future from from the state in the past and uh this posterior is also called a belief um i think we had the term belief already before um it just says you know our belief at um over this random variable um actually yeah it's, it's denoted with like this and then it um um it, but it actually means it's a probability distribution over the current state given all previous uh sensor measurements uh and now the bayes filter uh, just by applying the markov assumption um comes down to the following we can uh, iteratively or alternately uh, alternately um apply the motion model and the sensor model as follows we we start with our pr uh, previous belief from the previous time step and then uh, we apply our motion model um and mar marginalize over all previous states that we could have been potentially in and that gives us a prediction of our um of our belief where we uh, uh integrated the um the effects of our motion into it and then we make a sensor observation um and then again we can uh, update our belief according to the sensor observation and uh, as as you've seen before we have to normalize then uh, by the evidence uh, or normalize this belief distribution that it gets a proper uh, distribution again at the end um this example now uh, with the sum and so on is uh, written or for a for a discrete random variable but of course it also works for a continuous state and i should also note that sometimes it does not happen that you get one motion observation and one sensor observation uh um but it could also happen that you get several motion observations and uh, only one sensor observation once a second for example so it could happen that you update a few times the belief only according to this formula and then once in a while you get a reading from the camera and then you update it like this um yeah good so um let's look at this again more graphically assume that we have a um discrete state for the moment um so th this is this is a grid and the robot can be somewhere on this grid and um this means that we uh that our state is the robot has to be in one of these grid cells so it um the, the state is you know has two coordinates two discrete coordinates and um we are now interested in this belief distribution over this grid um for example we could the robot could think that it's somewhere located here uh, most likely in the in the middle um and then we would um uh, 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 visualize visualize this as follows uh, with this shades of gray so a uh, darker gray means uh, more likely so far so clear i guess good uh and now we uh, can define in this grid world an uh, emotion model uh assume that the robot can move in all four directions um and uh, of course these actions are never perfectly executed so we can model this with our motion model as follows we can say when we when we are located in a particular cell and we move to the right uh then afterwards we will be most likely in this cell uh to the right but there is a small probability that we end up in the neighboring cells um so we could again define a motion model that says 60% success uh, of doing this and then 10% being in one of the neighboring cells including staying at the same place good uh and then we could also define um an uh, observation model assume that there is one special cell that has a marker in it or that we can somehow detect uh which is a binary observation either we see the marker or we see don't see the marker and um um 
Yeah, and sometimes uh, also this, this uh, marker sensor is not perfect. Sometimes it also detects the marker already in the neighboring cells. So the sensor model would look like this. Uh, good. So uh, I tried to uh, do a simulation by myself uh, in PowerPoint. So the shades are not perfect, but it should give you an impression how this looks like. Um, so in, in the first first time step t equals zero, we assume that we know perfectly where we are. Um, so we have we have a one here in this cell and zero everywhere else. It could of course also be the case that we don't know anything uh, and then you would initialize such a grid or you would in in initialize the filter with equal probability in all cells, uh, which is then called a uniform prior. So uh, now assume that we walk to the right uh, one step uh, and we observe no marker. So. Um, this means we apply the first step of the base filter, uh, which just essentially uses, yeah, using convolution we get, or yeah, we apply the motion model and then we have this distribution afterwards. Um, and then um, we, so this is, then we integrated this, um, this motion step and then we ap apply the second, second step where we integrate the sensor observation and um, uh, because we have not observed the marker, um, uh, the probability of, of these cells here more or less remains the same. Uh, but we know that it is less likely that we are located in this cell because with a small probability we should have also detected this marker, which we haven't. So it's less likely that we are here, also still possible. And um, these cells get a bit more probability mass than as a result. Uh, good. Then we walk again to the right, um, which means that now for every cell we um, um, apply the motion model. So th this probability mass would get shifted here and spread out to the neighboring cells. Um, and that happens to, to all cells. So we summarize over all previous, um, we marginalize out the previous world state and then we end up with a distribution like this. So you see it feathers out, it gets larger, um, just because there is uncertainty in our motions. And uh, then again, we apply um, the observation model. Now let's assume that we have observed the marker. Also, we are not at the correct location, but we are in a neighboring cell. And um, again, now by applying the sensor model, uh, the robot knows that it can be the probability, it has to be either here or here. But because it had a prior a larger probability to be on the left side, um, it will hopefully also find that it's, um, that it's located here but it could still be uh, next to it. It could have happened that one of the steps where it moved to the right actually made it move two steps, and um, that would have led to an, uh, uh, likewise to an observation of this marker. Good. Um, to summarize that, um, this uh, Markov assumption is the key <laughs> to um, do recursive Bayesian updates uh, on the belief distribution. And it's a, it's a useful tool for estimating uh, uh, states of dynamic systems. And um, in principle, it forms, or the base filter is the basis of, of, of lots of other filters. In particular, the Kalman filter that I will look at, at the, in, in the rest of this um, lecture. Uh, but there are also different filters like particle filters or hidden Markov models. Um, I said the visualization that you've seen with the, uh, the Markov chain is a so-called dynamic Bayesian network, but there is more theory around it. And um, uh, there are more complicated um, um, concepts like uh, partially uh, observable Markov decision processes, um, yeah, where, um, yeah, in, in, in principle, which, yeah, which is the same that we have, um, um, but you don't know exactly what action you're carrying out and you don't know, um, uh, what, um, you, you only observe part of the state. Um, may I ask how many of you have seen a Kal the Kalman filter uh, before? Okay, good, roughly half of it. I mean, it, um, I, will, I will go through it, do the details, but there is, of course, much more theory. I guess there are even whole lectures only on Kalman filtering. Um, so you're not supposed to be able to do the der derivation afterwards by yourself, but you should get the big picture. Also, because in the next exercise sheet, you will have to implement part of the Kalman filter yourself. Um, good. So uh, the Kalman filter is in principle a base filter with continuous states. Um, you know, the, the one reason why the uh, base filter with a, or the histogram filter is not used a lot in practice is because you need uh, a very large uh, grid 
uh, that you have to store in memory and then you have to, up to do the updates in every cell individually. And that, that is of course not super efficient. Um, so the idea of the Kalman filter is to uh, represent the state instead as a normal distribution. And that means instead of having to save the probability in every cell, uh, it's enough to save the, the mean and the covariance of the, of the, of the belief distribution. It was developed uh, really long ago uh, by um, Mr. Kalman, uh, but, uh, who, who is a professor or who, yeah, who is um, a professor at ETH. Um, uh, and uh, but even before Kalman, other people have developed sim similar um, strategies to uh, to do such uh, estimation processes. And it has plenty of uh, applications, and it's probably the most um, widely used uh, filter in practice. <clears throat> Good. Um, let's briefly look at the normal distribution. Um, normal distributions are um, can, can be one-dimensional, for example. So we could have a random variable that is distributed normally, and a normal distribution is defined by its mean and its variance. And um, there is this uh, formula for the normal distribution that I guess most of you have seen before. Um, this is the um, uh, this is a plot of the normal distribution. It there is a mean somewhere. Um, uh, the, the sigma defines how large the, sp the spread is. Um, important properties are that the normal distribution is symmetric about the mean um, within one um, standard deviation, which means within one sigma you have 68% of the probability mass. Um, within two sigmas you have 95% of the probability mass and within three standard deviations you have uh, already 99% uh, of the probability mass. And this is sometimes that, uh, and, and because most of the mass actually is located between um, yeah, two or three standard deviations, um, um, people, uh, yeah, you, you see in a second what that means. So in, um, in the multivariate case, which means that our state variable has several dimensions, um, you, you get a similar formula, um, and then it's it's harder to visualize that, of course, in 2D. Uh, this is um, um, you, you can still visualize it as a 3D plot, for example. So this is the probability density function. There is again the mean that has the highest probability, and then depending on the covariance matrix, you get um, a different shape, uh, which uh, has the form of an of ellipses. So instead of plotting uh, a 2D um, normal distribution uh, from the side. People usually plot it um, from the top, and then uh, you're looking at the height lines, uh, the ISO lines uh, of different probability. And um, here it makes then then people usually plot um, the two standard deviations or three standard deviations uh, so, um, ellipse, uh, which means that you you can say then at the end uh, you know that uh, 95 or 90, 90, um, um, 99 percent. 99% the robot will be located within this, this ellipse. Um, so sometimes these ellipses are then also called the 95% the, the uh, ISO line or the 99% ISO line or 70% ISO line. Um, yeah, good. Um, there are a few nice properties of uh, normal distributions. For example, um, there are, you can Trans when you when you do a linear transformation on a normally distributed random variable, it remains Gaussian, and that's very useful. So imagine you have a random variable x that's normally distributed, and uh, now we take th this variable and multiply it by uh, a and add b uh, to it. Then the resulting random variable y will still be normally distributed, um, uh, just by you know um, doing the same transformation here on um, on the mean and uh, transforming the covariance matrix. Um, there, uh, the yeah, second important property is that if you intersect two Gaussians, the result is again a Gaussian. Um, and that, that's, that's what we need a lot, of course, in the base filter, because we have to uh, convolve uh, the sensor model, for example, with, the, um, uh, with our uh, um, uh, prior belief distribution. Um, <coughs> Yeah, and uh, and there is this formula that more or less computes. You, you can imagine this as a uh, uh, as a weighted average between the two uh, between the two random variables. So the, the if you have two normally distributed random variables, the resulting mean will be a mixture of the mean of the one of of, uh, of the first variable and uh, the mean of the second variable according to the covariances. So if the second um, 
um, the second random variable has a very high covariance, which means that it's very uncertain. Um, then, um, uh, th then mostly the, the the first mean will dominate, and and vice versa. And, and when both of these observations or both of these random variables have the same certainty, um, then it will be roughly in the middle of the two. Um, good. So um, again, we assume a Markov process or a Markov chain. Um, but now the idea is, yes. How do you divide uh, here? Oh, this is just, um, uh, again, um, to, um, to the power of minus one, um, this, this notation. I mean, you, I could also have written here parentheses around and then minus one. You take the inverse of both covariance matrices, uh, add them up, and then take again the inverse. This is what it, what it means. Uh, any other questions? OK. Um, good. So now we represent our belief state directly by a normal distribution. Um, and uh, we have two parameters, namely the, the mean and the covariance. And uh, now we assume that we have a system that, has a, uh, that, that evolves linearly over time, which means that um, this is our previous world state X uh, undergoes some linear transformation A, um, and that gives us a new, new state. Right, and the nice thing that you can see already now is that when x is a normal distribution, uh, x t minus one is a normal distribution, then also x t will be a normal distribution. And uh, of course, we can also uh, add in um, some controls. For example, you issue a control command, um, uh, then there might be a linear, um, or uh, under the assumption that there is a linear tr um, transformation that tells you how this control command will influence the state, then uh, we still have a, a linear, um, linear process model. And of course, uh, lastly, you could also have some, some noise. So from one to the next time step, uh, there might always be some, some noise that is again normally distributed. Uh, and yeah, and this is now the, the process model that we, that we assume for the Kalman filter. So we have a linear transformation on the state, we have a linear transformation on the controls, and we have some normally distributed noise. Uh, furthermore, the Kalman filter also assumes that there is a linear projection of the state to the, to the sensors. Um, so the C could be a matrix that, that explains how um, yeah, what the sensor uh, uh, probably will, will observe. Uh, of course, there could be also some zero mean noise. Um, yeah. And this is, this is the so-called um, linear um, stochastic, uh, um, uh, yeah, or uh, the, the, the linear state model underlying the Kalman filter, um, to, for, yeah, which explains how to get from the previous time step to the current time step, and how to get uh, the current measurement from the current state. And both of these noise terms here are normally distributed, and um, also the distribution underlying the previous state, the control and the controls is, is also normally distributed. And when this is the case, then you can compute this uh, very efficiently. Um, uh, yeah, as follows. This is just about the dimensions of the variables. Doesn't really matter. Um, so our initial belief about the world state is, is Gaussian, which means that we have, um, yeah, yeah, normal distribution in the beginning. If you don't know exactly where we are, you would initialize the initial belief with a very large sigma, because then, in principle, it doesn't, uh, it, it can be quickly changed to according to the sensor observations. Um, then, of course, our next state is also Gaussian, um, uh, just because uh, this is a linear transformations, tra transformation, and our observations are Gaussian. Um, because they also can be computed as a, as a linear uh, transformation from the state. And um, now um, the, uh, we apply again our base filter, uh, which has this integral over all previous states, and that gives, gives you this very large formula here. Uh, and if you would compute that by hand uh, or over a discrete set of states, then this can, could be very time consuming, of course. But now, because it happens that both the sensor model and the, uh, sorry, the, the action model and our previous belief are Gaussians. Um, you, you can find a, a closed form for, com for computing this. Um, 
um, yeah, so the, the resulting normal distribution uh, yeah, directly comes from the, uh, the rule that I've, I've shown before, how to, how to combine them. Um, the second step is that we have to apply the sensor model, and here again, we have two normal distributions that are um, in the intersected. And um, this derivation is a bit more complicated. So here you see uh, there is, so it again, of course, depends on the, the previous, um, uh, on, on the noise of the sensor observations and the previous belief. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, the formula is a bit more, more complicated. Um, but nevertheless, the cool thing is it can be computed in closed form. And uh, this is what the Kalman filter is. <laughs> um, I, I didn't want to go through all the details. If you're interested in this, uh, there is a der derivation, uh, I think it's a three page long in the probabilistic robotics book. Um, I, I guess the most important thing here is to memorize that uh, when you have these uh, normal, when you have the assumption of a linear um, stochastic system uh, and you have normal distributions, then you can very efficiently um, update, update your belief state according to these rules. And um, yeah, good. Um, yeah, because this, um, the only thing that you have to do and that costs time. I mean, all of these operations are super uh, efficient. You just have to multiply matrices with, with each other. The only thing that can be costly is the inversion of this of this matrix here. And um, I mean, for a small state with three or maybe six variables, like we do it, it this doesn't really count as, I mean, this, this is no time. But of course, um, you could have a larger system with hundreds of state variables. For example, if you consider different time delays and you keep all the different previous states, uh, then, um, then, this, uh, then the number of dimensions can quickly rise and then the inversion of this uh, equation is not, uh, this inversion of this matrix is not, uh, might not be as efficient as you want it to be. Um, for example, on the Pelican quadrocopter, uh, there is also a Kalman filter running, and it has, I think, 30 or uh, slightly above 30 um, state variables. And um, uh, in principle, you want to have the Kalman filter running uh, in real time on a, on, a, on a small embedded PC. You know, that's not can't get interrupted by disk access or something. So the Kalman filter or part of the Kalman filter run on an ARM processor, on a dedicated processor. Uh, but because this matrix inversion <laughs> is too complicated, then a 30 by 30 matrix is not something that you invert <laughs> uh, quickly, very quickly. Um, this is actually not possible to do on the, on the ARM processor, at least not today, maybe in a few years when processors are stronger. So um, the people who implemented this Kalman filter then decided to run this inversion of K um, on the on the real PC and only do the first part of the Kalman filter uh, on the on the embedded uh, system. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, in general, it's 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 definitely more efficient than the histogram filter. And uh, when the state space is small, then this can be this, then this is super fast. Um, of course, so far, or you can even prove that this is um, the optimal solution for your belief state um, for linear Gaussian systems. But in practice, of course, most robotic systems are nonlinear. Um, so how, how can we deal with this? Well, first of all, where does this nonlinearity come from? Do you have an idea? What makes the state equation nonlinear, for example? I mean, now that you have already implemented the odometry model, uh, you might have noticed that there is some part that's definitely not linear. Yes? Exactly. As soon as you have to deal with rotations, uh, it is, it's always nonlinear. Um, yeah, and this is why um, uh, the system by itself is, is nonlinear. And um, yeah, and this means that most robotics problems actually are nonlinear <laughs> because of the rotations in uh, SE3. Um, good. Um, and now the idea is that you can, of course, still define a motion function, and that's what you did. Um, in, for, for this exercise, or what you hopefully do today. <laughs> um, and you can define an observation function, but then both of these functions will not be linear. However, you can uh, still uh, linearize both functions just by a first order Taylor expansion, which means that you uh, take the current, you know, you, you develop it around a certain point, for example, around the current um, uh, mean. Uh, that, that, that you have, uh, and uh, you compute the derivative of this function, and then you multiply this derivative um, uh, by 
um, yeah, the, the, the further you go away, the more, so, so you, uh, uh, yeah, approximate it linearly. And, uh, yeah. and you can do the same for the observation function. So again, you uh, uh, develop it around the current mean of our state, which we have from the Kalman filter. And uh, then you say, okay, we take the uh, Jacobian uh, times um, the distance from the mean. And that will give us a reasonable approximation as long as we are close enough to, to the mean. Um, and uh, the, 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 this means that we now have, um, uh, again, we have li a linearized um, system. And um, uh, with this linearized system, you can again apply the Kalman filter. And then the Kalman filter is called an extended Kalman filter, uh, which essentially means that uh, in, in our state model, this uh, uh, matrix that um, uh, transforms the state changes in every time step because in every time step we get a d different linearization uh, for the motion model and for the observation model. Let me maybe go back again to uh, our state model. So, so we had this before, and here we had different. Um, we had a, we had a fixed. Uh, linear, fi fixed linear matrix that transforms our previous state to our current state and a fixed matrix that uh, defines how the controls are converted to, uh, to the state and, and a fixed matrix that defines the transformation from our current state to the observation. Um, but of course there is no reason why you could not have a different uh, linearization here in every time step and this is what the extended Kalman filter does. Clear intuitively so far what this means? Okay, good. Um, good. So um, uh, there is a brief example. Um, you m might uh, uh, want to use that for improving your solution uh, of the first exercise sheet. So uh, assume that we have a, uh, so this is the 2D case, so it's not directly applicable, but uh, in principle, this should look familiar to you when you've already done the exercise sheet. So we have uh, a state x, y, uh, phi, for example, and we assume that we get odometry measurements uh, of the speed in x and y direction and of uh, the rotation speed. And um, um, then we observe um, uh, a visual marker somewhere in space um, with a coordinate x and y and a certain uh, orientation phi, which is relative to the robot pose because the robot, of course, observes it with its camera and then everything is always in the frame of the camera. And we assume fixed time intervals. Uh, and this also, by the way, makes sense for your um, exercise sheets. In principle, you could measure the time interval every time independently, but it's also fine for me to just assume a certain time interval that you, uh, that you specify beforehand. Good. Then um, you can define this motion function, and this is probably what you, uh, or a similar thing that you have for your exercise sheet. Um, so you say, uh, my new position will be my old position in x direction plus uh, a term that uh, depends on um, the traveling speed and my current heading and the time of the, uh, the length of the time interval. The same for the y-axis and same, same for um, uh, the orientation. And then from this motion function here, we can of course compute the derivative, right? And this derivative then is the linear, um, is the matrix uh, the, uh, that, that, um, that we can use for our linearized um, uh, state model. And um, the same thing can be done, of course, for the observation function. And this is what you'll have to do for the second sheet. So you have to define um, the observation function that computes from the current state um, the expected um, the expected observation. And um, what? what? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so from the current state, you have to predict what will you probably see in the world. And then when you have this function, so it again contains some sine and cosines, <laughs> uh, uh, you can again compute uh, the, the derivative of this. And um, we already provide you with um, a framework that contains most of the Kalman filter, except for these two equations. So there will be two functions that you have to fill in. <laughs> and, um, and then you have a full Kalman filter. Um, so now, wait, maybe let's have go briefly back to the Kalman filter, I, I guess the, the update from the motion model is, is really clear because there you just have a linear transformation or a linearized transformation according to these equations. And the sensor model, 
I said that the, I mean the formula is a bit complicated, but um, what it essentially does is it has the previous mean um, that we, uh, uh, um, yeah. So so we have we have our uh, previous uh, mean from the previous time step, and we have our current observation, and we have a prediction here of um, of what we expect to see. Later, maybe I can even go back to the linearized version. I think I just I completely skipped that. Uh, part. So we have our previous uh, we have our previous mean, and we have a term um, k times the difference between our expectation of the observation and our real observation. So you remember that we had this um, observation model that just says we have a state x, we multiply it by c, and that gives us uh, our observation. And um, and the, the, the Kalman filter essentially does an update on the on the mean according to the difference between the obser observation and the predicted observation, and multiplies that by the so-called Kalman gain K, um, which expresses our confidence in the sensor measurements with respect to our previous um, uh, previous knowledge. So in this K, this this K is larger um, when we don't trust our previous. Uh, when we don't trust our prior, so when we are highly uncertain about um, uh, the, the previous world state or the initial world state, then we will directly take over the difference between uh, our uh, expectation and the observed value. On the other hand, if we are super certain about our current world state and we know that we have a very high noise in the, in the sensor measurements, um, then this Kalman update here, this Kalman gain will be super small and uh, the um, um, Observations will only minimally influence um, the estimate, uh, yeah, the state estimate. Good. So now at the end, uh, let's look at a few uh, examples. Um, so this is more or less what you what you have implemented uh, for the first exercise sheet. The robot is traveling along a certain path. We have. Um, um, we, we either know which commands we gave to the robot, or we get um, uh, odometry feedback from from a sensor, and uh, this means that we can integrate the position of the robot. So you see, this is the, the robot here. It it uh, travels around a rectangle, and uh, this ellipse um, shows. Uh, our uncertainty. So this is now the new part from the Kalman filter. The longer it travels, the more uncertain it will become. Um, and um, it could additionally be that uh, our robot has uh, a large noise not only in x and y direction, but also in, in its heading angle. So the, the further the robot travels, the less it is certain about its, actually, it, 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 its travel direction. And this leads to this, to this funny effect. So in the beginning, maybe I should stop here. Uh, at the beginning, so it um, you, you see uh, that the robot gets uh, uh, in, 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 in increasingly uncertain about its position in y direction because it doesn't really know whether it has turned left or right. But it you know it mo knows it moves forward, but it doesn't really know uh, how it is heading. So this means that this ellipse here gets gets larger and larger in, in y direction, and then as soon as it turns. Um, it's again uncertain about its orientation, and it has this previous uncertainty about its position, and um, uh, yeah, <laughs> and that leads to this uh, funny effect that the ellipse seems to turn. But it's actually just because we intersect two different Gaussians, and the one Gaussian is uncertainty in this direction, and then suddenly we get more uncertainty in this direction because we're also not sure where we are looking at. And uh, as you see, this the covariance can can grow very quickly. Now assume that we have a certain marker that the robot observes at a particular point in time. So as soon as it sees this marker, uh, it can update its position and decrease its um, uh, covariance matrix. So in the beginning, the uncertainty just grows, but then as soon as it detects the marker, um, the uncertainty will, will, will uh, shrink again and um, also the position gets corrected. At the moment you can't see, the, um, yeah, see that in a second. So, so imagine, for example, that uh, the robot doesn't know its initial position correctly, so it assumes it starts here, but in, in reality it starts here. Uh, and then the robot, of course, just integrates up its, its odometry readings, um, because there is nothing, this is the, the optimal thing that you can do if you don't have sensor measurements, but then at some point it sees the star, and, um, and then it can correct its position, of course, and can decrease its um, uncertainty about its, about its position. 
so you see as, as long as the robot is close to the star uh, it's really certain and then again uh, it, it increases it could of course also be that um, the um, initial uh, heading is wrong <laughs> uh, and that we have that we have noise in in the heading direction uh, and then we get again a similar picture so uncertainty increases as long as you don't see anything and then as soon as we see something it can correct its position and increase its confidence um, yeah when, when you know already that you don't have a good idea of where you are in the beginning, then you can start with a very large covariance ellipse. That makes it um, more. Uh, that this makes it easier to. Um, I mean, when the um, yeah, the, the, when the covariance is, is large, the robot will trust more its observations, and this means that it can more quickly jump to the right right position than when it, as soon as it sees the marker. Good, um, and then this is just another animation uh, where the marker is in the middle, and then it um, sees it whenever it comes uh, close enough to it, uh, and then you get a picture like this. Um, good. So that's it for today. Um, um, I hope that I made clear that all observations and all actions are inherently noisy, and that there is uh, it's always so, so it's always necessary to uh, look at probability distributions. Then um, this also means that our knowledge about the world is is always uncertain. Um, yeah, this is why we need the probabilistic sensor models and motion models. Uh, we've looked at different filters. In particular, the bias filter that you should be able to execute by hand, um, the histogram filter that is really intuitive uh, but not very efficient, and the Kalman filter. And uh, you will learn more about the Kalman filter now uh, by um, implementing this by yourself. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. What if the landmarks are not so certain as odometry? Um, what, what? So right now you said, okay, I see a landmark, I correct the uh, uh, coherences, but what if? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean that it's it, it's just computing um, um, an, uh, a weighted average, so to speak. So, so you see, it's not. You'll see that here in a second. So our position is is uncertain. Um, and as soon as we see the marker, um, the, our certainty uh, uh, increases. So the ellipse gets smaller because we know better where we are. Uh, but it's not suddenly jumping to the minimum value. You know, it's it's always finding a balance between the two. So if, if the marker perception was even even noisier, then it would take much longer for the robot for the for the state estimate of the robot to converge here to the right position. Then it would for a much longer time trust its odometry. It it might take several rounds for it to find the right position then. This could happen, depending on the, the noise values. And it's interesting to play around with these uh, with the with the noise values in the in the Kalman filter. Any other questions? Good, then, thank you a lot, and then see you next week. Mm -hmm.